Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tyler Barker. I serve as the coordinator within the Office of Parent and Family Programs here at Georgia Tech. Um, I want to welcome you to our What's Buzzing at Georgia Tech webinar series, where we are today focusing on thinking holistically about your student success. Uh, today we have two great presenters, uh, Beatrice and Stephanie, who will talk a little bit about student success at Georgia Tech and what that looks like. Um, so right now, if you'll give me a few moments, what I'll do is transition to the PowerPoint and then we'll begin. Uh, to the attendees who are on the webinar today, if you have any questions for our presenters while the presentation is going on, please feel free to utilize the Q&A chat box, um, which you can drop questions in there and then we'll answer them right after the presentation. And also just also we want you to just express anything that your student may be going through or struggling with, it will try to help you with that as well as it relates to student success. So please give me one moment. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Stephanie and Beatrice. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Beatrice Rodriguez, and I'm an assistant director in the Office of Undergraduate Advising and Transition. Hi, I'm Stephanie Luco, and I am the exploratory advisor in the Office of Undergraduate Advising and Transition. So, um, the image that you're seeing on the screen, um, thinking holistically about student success um, and the topic that we have for today, um, what we wanted to emphasize is that when students come to an institution college like Georgia Tech, um, we're not just necessarily focusing um, on academics and the students making a 4.0 of graduating uh, from Georgia Tech, but we're really thinking from the student perspective um, as a holistic person that is developing in college. So there's a lot of um, topics that overlap and um, on the graphic you see that there's some academic components that might overlap with some social, with self-care and well-being and being prepared for college, for a career after college. So I think that the emphasis that we are going to make with the programs and the conversation we're going to be having at the end with the Q&A is to really start thinking from those general perspective how our programs overlap. Um, the particular program that I work with is called Academic Coaching um, and part of it is thinking and how to help a student with the learning process, not the content of the class, but the learning through academics and how that, in, that interacts with their social um, and their ability to live a well-balanced life and also explore those extracurriculars in college while also taking care of themselves and that self-care. So all these areas overlap in the program when we're thinking about students' success. And for exploratory advising, so for exploratory advising, what you'll find is that for students, a lot of times if we think about careers um, and then we think about academics, um, that, that kind of combination of consciousness leads to a better selection of majors, minors, and certificates, and usually helps students feel more confident in the programs that they choose because it's easier for them to understand how it's preparing them for their career goals. The graphic that you're seeing display, um, Tyler, do you mind going back to that 7030? Excellent. Um, is an emphasis that we make with students um, when they come to talk to us, um, but also that we like to um, just share with parents so that way you have an idea of what the student is hearing on our end. Um, when we talk to students, we like to help them understand the transition that they're making and how um, it's not called 13th grade anymore, but now it's called first year at college and the difference, the basic difference um, is that in high school, students typically spend about 70% of the time inside the classroom the, doing the learning and about 30% outside. Um, so that's the reason why we have programs like the ones that we're going to mention in a few minutes 
because when the students transition to college, now we're in a position where about only 30% of the learning really happens in those class hours, um, and about 70% is self-study when they are outside um, doing the learning on their own or in groups, but outside of the classroom. So we're going to talk a little bit about the program exploratory advising, some key ways that I help students understand how they can benefit from exploratory advising, and then just a quick uh, explanation of the type of students who tend to benefit from coming to exploratory advising appointments. So overall, um, when students ask me what is exploratory advising, I tell them that it's a program, um, you know, you come into appointments and the goal is that we look at all the majors, minors, and certificates at Tech, and we try to customize a degree plan that's going to give you the skills that you want for your career goals. For some students, that means adding on a business certificate because their career might lead from research into industry. For some students, that means that they have an engineering degree, but maybe they also want to develop some design skills in case they want to go into product design. So it's really just about talking to the student, understanding what they want, and helping them customize their degree. For some students, that might mean that they're completely undecided and so then what we'll do is go through some assessments do some skills and strengths inventories and try to match what they're interested in and their skills to specific programs so then if we just quickly say how do i know if exploratory advising for me is the short answer is it's for everybody but here are a few key areas that i tend to target um, students who are in a major and maybe it's not what they expected or maybe they're not enjoying the courses you know, I tend to meet with them. For students who are simply thinking, I just want to add on another program. I like a lot of things and I want to know if there's a way to enhance those skills. I tell them they're coming for exploratory advising. For students who are like, I had to declare a major, but I don't know all the options at Tech and I don't even know if the major that I declared is going to work for me, coming for exploratory advising. And then just for students, like I said, if they're unsure if their major is a good fit for a myriad of reasons, I tell them to come in for exploratory advising. So then what this graph is showing you is just a quick visual aid to explain how the combination of majors, minors, and certificates can lead to um, some pretty exciting or interesting career outcomes. So if a student comes in and they tell me, well, I like, you know, clothing design specifically for sports. Maybe I want to design some kind of athletic gear. Maybe I want to you know, come up with a new design for helmets, thinking about um, medical safety, thinking about protecting students. Um, I would tell them, well, let's look at some programs that can help you do that, combine majors, minors, and certificates, and then help them understand what their career outcomes are. A lot of times what I end up doing is working in, working alongside career advisors to make sure that students know what their career goals are and then maybe we talk about majors or they know what majors they want and they meet with a career advisor to refine what kind of industry um, they should go into. And so this is just a quick graphic. I always tell students unless you know all of the majors, minors, and certificates at Tech, how do you know that you've picked the perfect uh, degree plan? So I simply tell students, make sure that you're going online and looking at all of your options and asking yourself, what is this program? What could I potentially learn? Just so that when you graduate, you know, I see fourth year students who are like, if I knew about this major on day one, this would have been my major. So I tell them, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about all of the majors, minors, and certificates because you never want to get to that point where you feel like there's no way that I could switch majors and still maintain my graduation timeline. I need to take myself off of mute. <laughs> so um, how would all these interacts, um, as you probably heard from Stephanie, is like Georgia Tech has a plethora of possibilities and sometimes a student comes to Georgia Tech and they start feeling overwhelmed um, either by the amount of resources available but the pace of their classes by the new environment that they're in and how learning needs to take place so that's why we have a program like academic coaching um, what it is is a program that allows a student to think about um, how to discover self-motivation how to manage self-regulation what is the process of learning? Um, and through that, they work with a professional staff member that helps them through this process. So um, 
some of the things that we hear, just to give you an idea of what happens in a coaching appointment, um, there's a variety of reasons why a student will be coming to see us. Um, some students will come because they're feeling overwhelmed and they're saying, um, I feel like there's a lot of work for all of my classes and I need to figure out how to organize myself and kind of create structure when we're in these 70, 30 percent where if I just go to my class, it's not enough. There's homeworks and there's study groups and there's all these different resources. So they need to create a structure for themselves and discover like a time management plan that works for them. Um, so that's a great reason um, or um, very popular reason why students come to academic coaching at the beginning of the semester or maybe towards the middle. Um, right now, um, it's week five and students are getting prepared to take exams. Um, so some of them want to create a strategy and a plan. It's like, how do I prepare for these? Um, we hear often from students saying that in high school, they never really learn how to study. Um, it's like all they focus on was just maybe the night before studying a little bit, really paying attention in class and that just produced the A's in class. But they're coming to an environment like Georgia Tech where learning is a little bit deeper and they're struggling with understanding how do they prepare for these round of exams or how do they balance having three exams at once. So that's what we do in an academic coaching session. We work with them. Um, it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of open ended questions to try to help the student figure it out on their own. What works best for them without us giving them direct advice about this is what you need to do. For some students it's about um, gaining confidence and having an opportunity to talk about the reality of how much they're struggling virtually with classes and recognizing that it's different and it's difficult to um, self-manage. So we have a conversation, we listen, we come up with ideas and plans that they can start incorporating in the next few weeks. Um, what we encourage students to do in academic coaching is to come back to us maybe every two weeks for some students is once a month. So that way we can have um, continuous relationships. So it's not just one session where they got all the information, but it's an opportunity to come back and say, this is what helped me. Um, or this is, um, I never thought about doing this this other way. Or maybe that didn't work and I need to create another plan. So it's an opportunity to work with somebody through the process that they're going through of learning the material that they need. Um, all our appointments are free for students and they have um, as many appointments as they need. So we don't cap at a certain number of appointments. Um, we have students that we have seen from first year all the way to graduation and we transition into these at the beginning is more about academics. And if we think back about the wheel, Later, it becomes a little bit more about social. How do I get involved or how do I start research and developing connections with my faculty members? Um, at some point, it might be something with well-being. How do I take care of myself and re-energize so I don't burn out by week six? So um, I would say that academic coaching is a relationship that the student develop with a coach, um, just like athletes will have coaches and in career people have life coaches. Um, in college, students have academic coaches. And some of the topics, I think I've already mentioned some of these. Um, the most common reasons why a student will come for academic coaching. Um, one, they want to create a study or time management plan. Um, procrastination has been something that has been very popular um, over the past maybe six months since we've gone virtually um, students trying to figure out how to not postpone and leave things for the last minute but how to be proactive um, or maybe just specific anti-procrastination techniques which we have and we share with them so um, we talk about study skills and test preparation that's typically the topic that it's been covered um, over the past few weeks since students are in exams um, also for some of them it's motivation. It's just how do I keep this energy and that drive, um, this high ach achiever attitude that I had in high school when I'm now in college and everything is done through a computer. Like, so how do I keep that motivation up? Um, I wanted, Tyler, do you mind transitioning to the next slide? I wanted to share with um, some of you because um, we talked at the beginning about the wheel. Um, and just some of the other services when we're thinking about students 
success being holistic, not just about classes, but what are other components or offices that could participate in these um, success for students? Um, in the realm of social, um, student engagement has been a key office. Um, students have the opportunity to get involved with clubs, develop hobbies, or nurture those hobbies. Um, there's been so many opportunities where I've worked with students where they remember that in high school they love to play guitar and they're recognizing like I need that outlet again in my life. So continuing to foster that social aspect, um, whether it's through a hobby or a club or organization, a fraternity or a sorority, um, well-being, um, learning how to care for themselves and um, energize or recognizing what saps their energy. Um, we get a lot of referrals from the care center, which I'm sure that you've already, um, if not already have heard about them, you will hear from them. Um, but care refers a lot of students to us because sometimes the students come to them saying, I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling depressed. Um, and when they get to the root of it is the student is a little overwhelmed with managing this responsibility of college. So they refer them to us. So we work um, in tandem with them. Um, academics, um, tutoring and academic support services is a great resource for students. Um, in coaching, we try to explore with students the um, idea that maybe they never had to use tutoring before in high school, but in college, tutoring is a great opportunity to connect with a classmate and somebody that already knows the subject and is trained. So it's an opportunity for um, students in this virtual environment to have a study group or a study buddy. Um, and who better than an upperclassman that already knows the subject? So that's how we connect them with academics as well. And career preparedness, like Stephanie mentioned, exploratory advising has been key for students that maybe they were just good in math and science in high school and they come to Georgia Tech thinking they want to be engineers, but they're not really decided yet. What does that path look like? So we connect with them through that. And what I will also say as far as student engagement, most majors have some a student organization that's connected to a professional society. And so these student organizations, the sessions that they have, they often have people who are working in industry come in and talk about how their major connects to their careers. So for undecided students or students who are just kind of exploring majors, I often tell them attend some of these sessions. It's a great way to learn what people are doing in industry so you can kind of decide if I majored in this, would I even want to be engaged in what's happening in the industry or if I'm interested in this, which areas within industry are exciting for me? This leads to great opportunities and in internships. It helps you connect with your peers so the students get a better idea of what to expect in years two and three and four. Um, and then it also helps students just in general gain a sense of community within their majors because that's also an important part of feeling like a major is a good fit. If you feel disconnected from all the students in the major, Maybe that contributes to some of the, the factors of thinking, is this the right fit for me? And then as Beatrice said, thinking along the lines of career preparedness, what career advisors are also going to do is help students develop resumes. They're really going to help them understand with this major, I've developed these skills. This is how I go ahead and put that on my resume so that when I apply for jobs, employers know what skills I've developed and they know what I can bring to a company. Um, so all of these things really contribute to students not just getting a good degree and enjoying their college experience, but being able to smoothly transition that into their career of choice. So one of the questions that we have just for the parents is, you know, in what areas do you see challenges um, in your student adjusting to college life? Overall, I think right now it's pretty unique because a lot of that transition is happening virtually. Um, but just thinking overall, what kind of challenges do you think students could face adjusting to college life? Just as a way to discuss it, but also for us, we can kind of recommend some campus resources that would assist them through that transition. Maybe what we can do is, um, since we have the Q&A, leave it open for parents to share that question that we pose. Um, of, um, in what areas do you see challenges in your student adjusting to college?
I think, I think you're you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie and Beatrice, for that wonderful presentation. Um, it seems that we don't have any questions just yet in the chat box. Parents, please, please feel free. Just talk to us about, you know, if your student is living on campus or if they're doing remote, you know, what what are they doing? Uh, how, how are they doing thus far this semester academically? What have you seen? What have you not seen in comparison to other years? We would love to just chat with you parents, so please drop that information in the Q&A chat box. Um, Uh, Beatrice, uh, for the I do have a question, or for Stephanie, um, for the for the students who are doing uh, virtual learning this semester, um, how, can they still access some of these resources through your office? And if so, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, I'll be happy to answer that one. Um, yes, all our services are definitely available to students. Um, what we have transitioned is to an online platform, so. We use blue jeans or if the student prefer teams like this um, platform or if it's maybe easier to connect through Skype or like we're, we've been very flexible, but I feel like the most common way for the students to access our service is make an appointment and we meet through blue jeans. Um, we have academic coaching, we have tutoring, we have plus sessions, which is um, um, supplemental or study groups for each specific course and obviously exploratory advising obviously uh, um, available as well. So all our services are available online. And then one thing I always encourage students to do is if you're in a different time zone and the appointment times aren't going to work for you or it would mean that you're having an appointment at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. Obviously nobody wants to do that. So just let us know. I have been um, working with quite a few students just to make sure that I'm available at a time that works well for both of us. If that means I'm up at 8 a.m., that works because I would rather me be up at 8 than you be up at 2 a.m. So in the comment section of your appointment, if that's a concern, I always tell students, just go ahead and put that in there so that we can try to come up with a better time to meet. Um, and then as Beatrice said, Blue Jeans, Teams, Skype, we're pretty flexible, just making sure that we get those appointments um, scheduled. I'm putting um, on the Q&A um, a link to all our services. What we also recognize is sometimes it takes a little bit of time for a student to make an appointment. Um, so we have all these resources available where they can start getting um, a little taste of what academic coaching, exploratory advising, or in general our services are. So we have specific um, handouts and materials on time management. We have videos as well. Um, so for parents, I think if, if you have a conversation with your student, about classes and you want to um, just remind them that these they can access like let's say the semester at a glance which is a time management tool that is very popular at tech it's available online or they can read more about how to prepare for exams there so we have a lot of resources available online um do you have any recommendations uh, for parents on how to support their students um, and just in follow up to that, um, especially with time management um, as well. If you could speak on that, especially for the parents who may have students who are virtual this semester and first year students. Absolutely. I think that um, we talk about that topic of time management at least in 60, 70 percent of our appointments. It always comes down to that because it ties to organization. And I have seen students showing me the planners, their parents bought them, um, and they just want to learn is how do I use these? Um, so some of the um, feedback or just kind of like um, things that I would like to remind parents, um, asking questions, and you could also ask coaching questions, like um, open-ended questions and um, asking them, um, what makes it difficult? Um, like you're you're struggling in that class. What makes it difficult to learn in that class? Um, or how are you managing your time? If they're maybe saying, I just don't have time. It's like, how are you managing your time? What are you doing? What's your organization plan? So that way you can really become a partner in listening to them. Um, and then maybe suggesting that now that you learn about academic coaching and these services is 
giving them ideas about maybe you want to talk to somebody and hear um, a little bit more about a different way or how to incorporate new things into that system. So I've always the thing, yeah, go ahead. The, the other thing that I would add to that is um, in transitioning from high school to college, you know, you're transitioning from a pretty prescriptive academic plan, you know, you've got people who are deciding what kind of courses you're going to take, what your schedule looks like. And so in that transition to college, what a lot of students are facing is just this uncertainty in how do I manage this big switch? So I always tell parents to just kind of be patient with them. I know that that sounds simple, but it is it is a difficult transition to to go from having someone making these plans for you to it all being something you decide. And in that same way, kind of giving students the freedom to, you know, if if they are thinking about switching majors, kind of giving them that freedom. Um, a lot of times students will feel pressure to pursue one major or the other, and that pressure makes them um, incapable of looking at other options or even understanding their interests. So I always tell just give students space to explore what it means to be a college student and explore what it means to decide what they want to do with their careers. Um, Stephanie, I have a question for you. Um, if I'm a student and I want to and I want to pursue two minors, is that possible? And, and if so, what does that process look like? Yes, so the maximum that you can pursue is two minors. So that's kind of the limit. Um, what that process looks like is you'll have to, for some majors they have a, or minors, they have a change of minor session. So you go into the interest meeting, you will have to take a form that you get signed by your, the advisor for your major and then the advisor for the minor. And then that form is submitted to the registrar's office what that will then do is update all the students' records and they're able to sign up for courses for the minor. One thing to keep in mind, and this is what you can see on the advising website, is the requirements. Some minors have course prerequisites, some minors have GPA prerequisites, and then some minors, they just are, they just uh, don't have those requirements, but you probably wanna think about it before you enter them because they might be a little bit more rigorous. So those are the key considerations. Um, is there a change of major session that you need, to, change of minor session that you need to sign up for? Do you have that form completed? And then are there prerequisites and do you meet those requirements? And if not, should you be planning next semester to be able to meet those requirements in the future? Thank you so much for sharing that, Stephanie. And I have one more question for you as well. Um, if me and my student um, as a parent aren't seeing eye to eye about um, a major change. Um, do I have the opportunity to sit in on the exploratory advising ses session as well to learn more information? So a lot of the appointments are, I mean, the idea is that it will be student and advisor focused for two reasons. One, because of federal regulations, so FERPA, there are some, there, the student's academic record can only be shared with the student unless there is a waiver that's completed. So typically those appointments are gonna be between advisor and student. However, if um, a parent is interested in the information that's being shared or has general questions, I always encourage emails. Um, I'm pretty quick about answering those emails, answering parent questions, and I do receive them sometimes. So that's what I would typically say is refer for regulations and also for students. I think that the one-on-one -on -one format tends to work a little bit better. I can dig in a little bit deeper, learn more about them. But again, email me if you have questions and in some circumstances, I can understand if parents want to be involved, but that would be um, something that I would need to communicate with the student on to gauge their comfort level. And, and do you have any advice just when parents are having that that conversation at the kitchen table about changing majors, you know, maybe just exercise a little bit more patience or just try to be more understanding? Any advice to parents that because, you know, some parents may be caught off guard when they hear that for the first time. So I often tell parents when you have a student who talks about changing, and I tell students the same thing, from the parent side, when they talk about changing majors, listen to the whys, because it could be deeper than a simple major change, and it could be important that that major change happens. For the students, I always tell them, let's do as much research as possible so that your parents understand that you're not doing this on a whim, but it's a change that's leading to a particular career that you thought through. Because I think that for parents, if students are gonna switch majors, they wanna know that you're gonna be successful going down that new path. They wanna know that you thought out careers. So for the student, I say let's do some research. Let's go into this um, this conversation with your parents with more knowledge. I mean, not just kind of being random like I'm switching my major, right? And not explaining where your thought process is. And for parents, when your student says I'm switching my major, not saying no, 
right, trying to listen and understand where the student is coming from. So there's a little bit of work on both ends is what I would typically say. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think uh, learning that why is super important, as you said, because it can just un unveil so many things. Um, uh, Beatrice or Stephanie, if you want to take this next question, uh, what is the recommended amount of credit hours to take each semester? And if my student is virtual only, should they be taking more to get kind of get ahead? Do you so, want me to take that one or you want to start? I can give you the complete College Georgia definition, right? So um, what we typically recommend as um, a measure of, so statistically, student success is 15 hours. However, um, online, I would I don't know how I would feel about taking more than 15 hours because you have to remember that um, online the onus is 100% on the student um, to manage that time and that can be a little bit difficult. So I would say if you have never taken classes before, you probably don't want to go over 15 hours if you've never taken college classes. For maybe a student who's in their second or third year, they should have a better idea of gauging credit hours and their ability to be successful academically. Um, but that's just one view. Beatrice, I'll leave it to you for yeah. more perspective. Um, this is a conversation too that um, I smile because students are such high achievers and they want to just try to maximize their time and get out of tech quickly. Um, and it also costs money for parents um, if you're helping students. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that Stephanie said. I don't think that in this virtual environment when so much um, responsibility is put on the student, um, the route is to go with more classes. Um, it's like a lot of uncertainty. There's sometimes just emailing the professor is not as easy as like, I'm going to go walking into the office hours and ask a question. So things may take a little more um, and learning too with the 70 30 we talked at the beginning think about just enrolling 15 hours what does that 70 percent looks like of time that they need to be doing things on their own so in an academic coaching session when a student is interested in exploring should i take more um should i take less um we do an exercise that is called three to one um and what it is is we ask the student to list the classes that they want to take and the number of credits and multiply that number of credits by the level of difficulty. I mean, if it's a difficult class, I'm going to multiply by three. If it's a medium by two, if it's a easier class, not so demanding by one. So their maths, for example, if they're taking differential calculus, um, that's a two credit hour class, but it's difficult. So it means that if I just register for that class, I need to put in about six hours of time on my own outside of class studying. And when you start adding all that up, for some students it becomes like 40, 50 hours that they need to study just for those 15 credits. Um, and then they recognize like, whoa, that's a full time job and a little more. <laughs> so maybe I'm going to pace myself. Um, I also remind students that, um, especially in the STEM field, their classes are building blocks, so you don't want to rush through a math, you don't want to rush through a chemistry course or a physics course, because later the next class is going to build up on that. So it's better to pace yourself and really learn these foundations um, for first year students transition. Um, you're in a in a new college, discovering, making new friends, connecting with careers, just so many other things that is better to face yourself at the beginning and make sure you're successful. And then once you have that first semester or first year under your belt, maybe recognizing, do I feel like I can take more? Or maybe that take more is not more classes. Maybe it is get more involved, not just become a member in a club, but maybe actually become like the secretary or president of a club. So um, I'm very um, conservative with number of credits because for me it's more important that the student feels successful and confident um, in managing classes than just feeling like they're, like they say to me, I'm feeling like I'm drinking water from a water hydrant. <laughs> I don't want them to have that circumstances. So that's why I recommend always to pace themselves with lower credits. Thank you so much for sharing that to, uh, to the both of you. Um, do students have a general advisor as well as a major specific advisor? Um, if this has been addressed previously, my apologies for joining late. So students have their advisor for their major. 
For some uh, majors, it's decided by their last name. And this, again, can be found if you go to advising.gotech.edu. You can search by major and you can find out who your advisor is if it's subdivided by last name. There is no general advisor. However, I find that for some of the general questions, for some of the overarching concepts that students tend to email me, um, I am an exploratory advisor, but I have also been an advisor for specific majors. So I tend to know a little bit on both sides of the equation. And um, St Stephanie, if you can just touch on um, what the advising process looks like in, in terms of communication and interaction. Um, does my student meet with the advisor monthly, uh, every two months? Can they meet with them more frequently than most? Um, and, and what does that look like? So um, if you need to meet with your advisor more than once, that's fine. For me as an exploratory advisor, I always tell students to make as many appointments as you need to feel confident in whatever your academic pathway is. For major advisors, they might want you to only meet with them once or twice a semester. Their loads tend to be a little bit different. They meet with more students, so it kind of varies. Um, but again, you would go into a advisor link and there you can see who your advisor is. You can see their appointment availability and schedule those appointments and try to schedule them around your academic calendar so that you're able to attend those appointments. Um, I haven't heard an advisor limit the number of appointments on a student, um, but I would say you know, kind of use discretion. Maybe, you know, you don't want to meet with your advisor every day, but if you need to meet with them quite a few times to feel confident in your major, that's something that advisors are willing to work with students on. Thank you so much. And uh, if you don't mind, Stephanie, just for the parents and family members who joined the webinar late, if you can just touch on what exploratory advising is and uh, what you pretty much like what your office does for students. Mm -hmm. So exploratory advising is it's basically a collaboration between myself, students, career advising, and multiple resources on campus with the idea of helping students select majors, minors, and certificate programs that match their interests, their skill sets, their aptitude, and their career goals. Often what students will end up doing is maybe meeting with a career advisor, looking at different career opportunities, and then meeting with me to discuss programs at tech that will prepare them for that career, or meeting with me to discuss what they're interested in and then meeting with a career advisor to discuss based on your interest here are some careers or um, here's some potential career pathways that you could pursue so exploratory advising essentially is really getting to know a student and helping them find the right programs at tech for them students often don't know all of the programs so sometimes a student will tell me i'm interested in 30 things and they'll tell me all 30 and i'll say well there's a major for that, there's a minor for that, there's a certificate for that, and I give them those options and they get to make the decision on which combination of programs they're gonna pursue. Thank you for sharing that, Stephanie. Um, seeing that we have another comment, um, a parent has opened up to us about her student, and so it says, uh, my student has had a difficult time figuring out her major. We are supportive and have told her that there are no bad majors at Georgia Tech but she seems to be relying on older students slash friends for information. How can I encourage her to seek out these services that we've talked about today that are so great? I would tell her that, you know, every student is unique and every student's career pathways, career goals are unique and that it makes sense to meet with someone whose goal is to understand you and try to match you with the best programs. Peers are always a great resource, but one thing students have to keep in mind is that everyone's a little bit different. Um, everybody's career goals are a little bit different. Everybody's skills and aptitudes are a little bit different. So try to meet with an impartial party whose sole purpose is to talk to you and to understand you and your interest in matching with programs as opposed to your peers who might already be in the major and feel like if you're in a major, you probably think your major is the best one at tech. So that's something to keep in mind. <laughs> uh, Beatrice, I have a, I do have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be very hard for my student uh, to become motivated, um, to perhaps just down um, and, and to get self-motivated about you know, taking virtual classes or what have you. Um, any advice or just any any resources through the coaching program that can be useful for him? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that recognizing how difficult it is, I think that's the, the most important thing. Sometimes the motivation um, has to do with um, 
the format, the learning format. Um, so in a coaching appointment or as a parent, I would probably ask um, what is making it difficult? Um, let's explore, is it the format of the class? Is it maybe that you're always at home studying in the same place and you need that routine and that structure? Um, a lot of students have been through high school in a very structured environment. Like they know what time they wake up, they know what time they do homework, they do classes, they go to sports, and then they come to tech virtually and they're finding themselves with all this free time. Um, but is it that sometimes it motivates you? Um, so one of the one of the easiest um, things that we've talked to students is like talk to me about your routine before you log in into classes. Um, because if you're just logging into a computer from your bed or you're still in pajamas, sometimes that just doesn't prepare you with that mindset. Um, so we ask them about that routine in the morning or how are they organizing their time um, to feel like they're really um, in college. Um, I had a student last week that her decision was to leave her dorm. She was taking, watching lectures on her dorm, in her dorm room, but that was the same place where she relaxed, where she played video games. And um, she was realizing like, I need to get prepared and ready and out. So I feel like I'm in that mode and my motivation comes back. Um, but um, when I, when we do academic coaching, we recognize this um, motivation is a it's a very challenging thing in this virtual environment um just how to stay connected and engaged and curious and excited about learning um when we're in these formats so we like to talk to students about about that just really dissecting the format and if that's where the motivation is coming the lack of motivation is coming from thank you uh, the next question that i have is for stephanie um, Stephanie, from your experience, can you talk about the benefits of encouraging my student to pursue um, the office, the office hours of his or their faculty member um, and just what are the benefits of establishing a relationship with faculty members? So there are like a number of them, but I'm going to narrow it down so I don't overload. Um, one of them is just to know that faculty are really passionate about the major. They're passionate about the subject matter. If a student is uncertain if a major is a good fit for them or if they're uncertain about the trajectory of the major, faculty have lived it, right? They completed these degrees. They are teaching. Maybe they've worked in industry. So faculty is just a great resource to understand what a major can do for you, what a course can do. The other great thing about faculty is, and this is maybe looking down the road, especially if you're thinking about internships, your career, you're thinking about master's degrees, you want relationships with faculty because they're going to be able to talk to an employer and say, yes, I do know about this student. Yes, here's a letter of recommendation, right? And those are important things when you think about the future. Um, so faculty are useful in just because they're obsessed with their subjects, they're going to talk your ear off. If you're uncertain about the course, they like the course because they're teaching it, so they're excited to talk to students about it. Um, I always tell students, don't be nervous about talking to faculty. Understand that they are your resource, right? They're going to connect you um, to understanding more about the subject matter. And then beyond that, faculty are just, I mean, of course, you do want to make sure, and this is an email etiquette thing, right? Make sure that you address the faculty properly when you're emailing them, but just feel get comfortable with maybe being a little uncomfortable at the beginning and then later on you'll be able to talk to faculty more comfortably but they do want to help so i would just say talk to them when you can as often as you can and to get the kind of help that you need um, to feel successful yes yeah, that's, that's awesome advice i think at georgia tech where students are so lucky because we have some of the most renowned faculty you know in the entire uh, academy so I, I think that tech students are very lucky to have that access. Next question, um, as, a, as a parent, um, how soon or how late should I be pushing my student to pursue an internship or a co-op um, if it's their first year? I can, yeah. Yeah. Take a stab at. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think that it's ever um, too soon. Um, I've worked with students that they are starting to, they start like at first year students, they went to career fair, which is about to happen virtually. 
um, just like to browse. Um, no pressure on like I am now looking for a job. It's more like I'm curious. How does this work? And like, let me see what companies are here. And then all of a sudden they end up with a job offer. <laughs> so they are now having plans for their next summer or their next fall. So I don't necessarily think that it's never too early or too soon. Um, I like for first years to approach it from an exploratory kind of way. Um, I don't know what you think, Stephanie. Yeah, so with internships, I always tell students it's really never too soon to apply for an internship. And if you're, for whatever reason, ineligible for the um, internship, they're always going to tell you like whether they want a first, second or third year. They're going to tell you the kind of skills they want to have you. They want you to have before you apply so students can kind of gauge which program is going to be a good fit for them. Um, the other thing I tell students about internships is exactly what Beatrice said, right? Sometimes it's just to help you explore and figure out is this what I want? Is this not what I want? And internships do sometimes lead to jobs, right? So that's another way that you could just turn an internship into your career or treat an internship like a really great learning experience for the industry. So I always think it's never too soon um, and there are always going to be great ways for you to learn whether or not this career in theory, whatever you had in your head about what you would be doing, matches reality. As you were talking, Stephanie, I was thinking how many students do an internship um, and then they come back and it's like, I need to change my major. This is not what I thought it was going to be and, and I need to figure something out. Or on the opposite, students that come back so excited about everything that they learn that it just re-energizes them for courses. Like now they want to learn about the formable body because they know what that means in the work. Mm -hmm. So connecting that career with classes, I think is a great opportunity that tech has a strong program. And it does increase motivation, like you said, for some students. And I have had students who come back and they're like, um, I just spent the summer in a lab. Let's talk. So it's good for students, right? Either way, it really helps them figure out, um, just like you said, if what they want matches what they would actually be doing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so what we'll do now is just turn it over. If either one of you have any closing remarks, uh, Stephanie, we can start with you just to leave parents any advice, anything. So overall, what I always say about exploratory advising is if you don't need it now, you might need it in the future. So it's always a good program to know about because students, you know, their confidence in their degree programs kind of waxes and wanes. If you do feel confident in your program, maybe you don't need exploratory advising, but maybe through internships and taking courses, you've refined what pathway you want to go down and we can have a conversation just about adding minors or certificates. Maybe through taking courses, you realize you do want to shift your major. So just kind of keep in mind that exploratory advising is going to be a good resource more likely than not and helping students just refine the kind of programs that they pursue. And like um, the tagline that I've been using for exploratory advising is custom your experience at tech, right? Let's make sure that when you graduate, the pathway that you pursued matches you instead of, you know, being the blueprint of your friend or someone across the hall who told you this is what you should do at tech. Yeah, um, and for for academic coaching, um, what I would say is just for parents to remember that there are professional staff on campus that a student can come talk to if they just want to discuss these process of learning. Um, it's not just specifically getting in the weeds of thermodynamics or calculus or the chemistry, um, but it's how am I organizing myself and seeing these um, from um, a bird's eye view of what is happening with my semester and my college and my learning. Um, for parents, I would encourage you, just like we do in coaching, asking open-ended questions. I've found like that is magic with students. They just open up and they start telling you all about things and maybe they will tell you things that you didn't even want to know. But asking open ended questions like um, what is what what interests you about that major or um, what are you liking at Georgia Tech so far? Um, what makes it challenging? Um, just asking questions so that way they can explore and reflect on their own experience that just goes miles with students. Yes, I, I think that's that's really key and really great. Um, thank you both uh, Beatrice and Stephanie for just taking the time out to uh, talk with the parents and families today. 
um, some really great knowledge, some really great information and resources. Uh, parents, if you can, uh, join us tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, where we have the Office of Disability Services uh, join us and just kind of talking a little bit about what they do, um, and accessibility and testing, and getting your student register um, if they have a disability. Um, so, so really great information tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, if you want to view the recording of today's webinar, um, it will be, be available within the next 24 hours um, at our website, parents.gatech.edu. Um, under the Stay Connected tab under virtual recordings. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. And you can also find previous recordings as well. Uh, well. Other than that, just thank you all for being here today and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Go Jackets. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.